This morning, uh, the speaker for this morning is my good friend. You know, um, heaven will be a wonderful place where people from all different countries, all different races will meet together at the feet of Jesus. And um, a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity um, to have a full taste of what heaven will be like, you know, as, you know, I, you know, when I, uh, uh, um, you know, went off to do, uh, you know, you know, uh, graduate studies, you know, by meeting, you know, persons from all different countries, you know, you know, and, 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 and one of those persons I met um, is my very good friend, um, Dr. Pavel uh, Zopkov. Um, Dr. Zopkov um, was, is a native of Russia. He was actually born in Uzbekistan, uh, the former USSR. Um, he, he earned his bachelor's degree um, from from Zarovsky University in, um, in Russia um, and his master's from Andrews. And then he completed his PhD from the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies in the Philippines where we met. Um, he has worked, uh, he has served as, as a, an executive secretary um, in the, um, in, at a conference level in South Russia um, for over nine years. And um, he is married um, to the wonderful uh, Lilia. And um, they have uh, four children. Um, uh, the first is Constantine, who is 21. Uh, Margarita, who is 19, Alexander, who is 18, and Veronica, who is 10. Um, currently, uh, he serves as uh, one of the professors over at our seminary in the Philippines. Um, you know, uh, Pavel, as I call him, um, is just such a wonderful, um, Christ-like um, individual someone that is just so charming to get to know. Um, during my uh, studies, and uh, we were um, classmates together, and um, both he and I, you know, um, you know, um, we got to know each other and each other families, and, you know, and, 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 and we have had so many wonderful times together, um, camping with the young people, you know, you know, climbing the mountains in the Philippines. Um, he, he's very adventurous, um, you know, very outgoing and, uh, you know, very people oriented. Uh, last um, summer, that was 2019, um, I had a chance to, um, to, to spend a Sabbath with um, he and his family um, uh, back in the Philippines. And, you know, they were so very gracious to myself and my family. And, uh, you know, uh, Pavel, we want to just thank God for your ministry. And I know that God has, um, is doing great things in your life as you impact the lives of, um, of students who sit at your feet. And today here at Wilsden, we are so very happy uh, to have you here um, speaking to us. And uh, we know that God has given you a message for um, his people today. And uh, we pray that God uh, will bless you um, as, he prepare, as, as he has prepared you to speak to us. Pastor Mario, <clears throat> I am truly blessed to know you and uh, I'm th thank you for the generous uh, uh, introduction um, that you know is too much <laughs> you made me shy anyway I cherish our uh, friendship and this is a new opportunity for us to to share the the, the word through uh, internet and even we are apart for thousands of kilometers uh, that's a blessing to share together and to come together to worship the Lord. I think this is tremendous new opportunities of this, uh, such a time as this. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I want to bring you warm greetings from the southern, uh, southeastern part of the world, uh, Philippines. Uh, it's a wet season now here. We have plenty of rain and it's a uh, 
pretty hard. Um, thank you for the beautiful music. Uh, I enjoyed uh, the praise uh, group uh, singing to the Lord. Uh, that's indeed a blessing. So today, uh, this is my privilege to share this, uh, some of uh, my reflections on, uh, on the Bible. And uh, let us now um, uh, together um, uh, focus on the Word of God. How do you react when someone interrupts your plan? What kind of feeling do you experience? I vividly remember from my childhood when I was uh, a boy and we planned to go to uh, my grandma's village. And just before the trip, my father would say, you know, we change our plans. It was such a disappointment to me. Disappointment to me. I was even angry at my parents. Why did they cancel this long awaited trip? They promised to go and they did not go. When we become adults, we experience such disappointments even more often. We all have our plans, expectations, our dreams, but then something intervenes and our whole life seems falling apart. In like manner, when we are disappointed with some people, or uh, circumstances, we may be disappointed with God as well. Now I would like to draw your attention to such a story in the Bible. Let me share my screen now. I would like to ask you to open to open the Gospel of Mark with me. The Gospel of Mark and chapter 6 and verses uh, 45 to 52. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mount, mountain to pray. It is interesting. Um, it is only here when Jesus was so much compelling to push his disciples to the boat. This is the first time and the only time when he uses the strong Greek word, he made his disciples get into the boat. There is a Greek word, anakadzo, means to force, to compel, to urge. The same word Luke uses to describe how Paul was persecuting God's church in Acts. And this is uh, chapter 26, verse 11. And as I push them often in all the synagogues, I try to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. You can see that this word means a lot. That means to really force, to do something. Now question arises, um, why such an urgency? Why such a compelling reason to push them to the boat and to the sea to the other side? In John uh, 6, in the Gospel of John chapter 6 and verse 15, um, there is more details on that instance. It says, so Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain to pray to by himself alone. So you can see there was another force. And the force was to take him and make him a king. There was a perfect moment to that, let's say. He just performed the miracle of feeding 5,000 people. And this crowd 
was so excited what Jesus just done has done. They were uh, talking between themselves and the disciples caught the moment and uh, Ellen White says it was Judah who first caught this idea of, uh, you know, uh, planning uh, to enthrone Jesus at the spot to make him a king. And disciples were in tune with the multitude. They wanted to use that moment to achieve a long way to go because this was their understanding, this was their imagination, what would be the best, the ideal of God's, of Jesus's mission on the earth. That is of course to become a king and to become the ruler of all these people who were like sheep without the shepherd. But more than that, they wanted freedom. They wanted some political goals to be achieved and many other things in the agenda. And when the moment has come, they didn't want to lose it. So they came together, they plotted, and uh, they decided to go along with their plan. Ellen White says um, in the book of The Desire of Ages, never before had a command from Christ seemed so impossible of fulfillment. Jesus was so much disturbing to them. They didn't want to go into the boat. They didn't want to, to waste such a moment. But Jesus was very compelling. No compromise. He dismissed the crowd. He pushed his disciples, discouraged disciples to the boat, and he went to the mountain to pray. And it says, uh, it reads, uh, they had left Jesus with dissatisfied hearts, more impatient with him than ever before since acknowledging him as their Lord. They murmured because they had not been permitted to proclaim him king. They blamed themselves for yielding so readily to his command. They reasoned that if they had been more persistent, they might have accomplished their purpose. You see, that is truly a disappointment. A stormy night was ahead of them. When they started into the sea, they didn't know what was awaiting of them in there. And I was thinking, isn't, isn't it cruel to just push them to this stormy sea and Jesus did not go with them. He left them alone and he went to the mountain to pray. And how do we feel about when we are forced to move? What if God is behind that disastrous move for us? Let me share my screen again. And I would like to make this statement. When God wants to change something, he must thinks and people. Friends, this is something that we may not like. When God wants to change something, he moves things and people. There is a divine force behind people's moves. Moving actually is God's special instrument of change. In line with this, I would like to share with you three divine purposes behind moving. The first one is the Israel experience in the desert. In the book of Exodus, chapter 19 and verse 4, uh, God says, the reason behind bringing people from Egypt to the promised land is what? You yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. 
This is God's perspective of what was going on. But there is another perspective. When they crossed the, the Red Sea, they, were, they went to the wilderness. And after three days of trip, they started to ask, where is the water to drink? There was no water. And when they found the, the water source, it was bitter. Later on, they said, there is no more food. Our stocks are decreasing. Uh, our uh, livestock is decreasing. And there is no more uh, living creature around in this desert. So they were asking Moses and actually they were mourning to Moses and complaining. And they said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with first? So that was another perspective of the same story, a human perspective. How can we see the reality, the reality so different from what God sees it? You see, um, God says, I brought you to myself. And when, when the Israelites are asking Moses what happened with them, and they blame him that he brought them from Egypt. You brought us up from Egypt. So who brought them? Moses or God? The exodus experience is an important experience to understand because that is an experience to grow people. God was moving this, uh, this multitude of people to help them um, to help them trust in him. Ellen White says, that even there was seemingly no water and no food, does that mean that God stopped uh, caring for them? No. And does that mean that they, they were starving or thirsty? No. Neither of this. They still had something, but just for the day. They did not have something to eat or drink tomorrow. Not now. So their problem was not to trust in God today. They thought there will be nothing tomorrow as they have not seen nothing around them. So there was lack of trust. That was the problem. And the lack of trust, it confused them to misinterpret their reality. Um, does God really care? That's the question we need to answer when we enter into a new reality. Now we, I want to move you uh, further, a few hundred years uh, further to the exodus experience, uh, to the exile experience. It is already much later, and uh, now people were struggling with the new move, another important and serious move. After so many years and messages and attempts to bring to attention their disobedience, people still failed. So God decided to move them to Babylon, to correct them, the move to correct. From people's perspective, when God said, you are going to Babylon through prophets, through several prophets, including prophet Jeremiah, he was very clear, you will go to Israel. Uh, and it says in, in, uh, in Micah chapter 4 and verse 10, and to Babylon you shall go. There you shall be delivered. There the Lord will redeem you. You see? So there was no other way. The exile experience was important to be delivered, to be corrected, to be cleansed. It was important stage in their life. But what was the perspective of, uh, of Israelites? It seems from what we see from the Jeremiah chapter 37, verse 9, they were saying the Chaldeans will surely depart from us. They still believed that God will not allow them to be surrendered, to, to be captured uh, 
and taken to exile by Babylonians, by Chaldeans. So up until the very end, they did not give up their hope of being delivered. But God was very crystal, crystal clear, you will go to Babylon. They did not want to go to, go to Babylon. Um, another problem, when they went to Babylon still, you remember what happened there. Uh, when they recall the experience in uh, staying in Babylon in Psalm 137, chapter uh, uh, in a few verse, verses, the whole the whole uh, song is about that is um, a song of of mourning in Babylon by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down here we wept when we remembered Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land when? The enemies were asking them to sing. They said, how can we sing in the foreign land? Well, what was the perspective of the same thing from God's eyes, from God's uh, point of view? Jeremiah 29, verse 7, And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. No need to mourn, no need to cry, you need to serve that was the call from the lord remember daniel and his friends they took a right decision to serve and to be active in that exile now there is a story i would like to share with you about attitudes there is a story told by one old man who was a german um, who was, who was in, in German labor camp during World War II. He said there was one soldier from Belarus under personal number 709. In that concentration camp, in that labor camp, he refused to work on Sabbath due to keeping the fourth commandment. And all other captives, all other prisoners we're thinking he is uh, crazy. He is coming out of his mind. He will be killed. Major Kruger, an officer in charge, was determined to help the prisoner get rid of his strange beliefs. So he ordered to set up a gallows to hang the soldier by his hand tied behind his back for four hours. Imagine such a torture. Such a position caused an intolerable, in, in intolerable, in intolerable pain in his joints and in his muscles. So after 20 to 30 minutes of hanging, he was uh, falling unconscious. He was fainting. They put him down. They uh, splashed uh, a bucket of water on him, uh, give him a rest for a few minutes, and then hung him again. And several times until the four hours passed. After that, almost that, they brought him to the barrack and threw him inside. His name was Andrew, and he was from Belarus. All the soldiers, all the other uh, prisoners, uh, they were pretty uh, sure that he will give up next Sabbath. He will go to work next Sabbath. But surprisingly, he didn't. Still, he was, uh, he was persistent in his faith. And he wanted to keep his Sabbath still. So what happened? Uh, Major Kruger continued his torture. And he was even more cruel than before. He devised a new, new ways of torturing him even more and more. Once he approached Andrew uh, and he told him, in front of all the prisoners. And he said, I am your God here. And you will get out of this camp only through the grave. 
very clear. To which Andrew replied, Sir, if God wills, he will bring me out by your hand. And all laughed at him, including uh, the uh, the including the, the officer and all the fellows, fellow soldiers. As time went by, Andrew was treated worse and worse, and he was doing all the dirty job, the dirtiest job in that camp. He was treated maliciously. Major uh, Kruger was very cruel to all the prisoners, and he could easily execute a soldier for a little shortcoming, and many were shot and executed. Everyone in camp hated him. There was an old bo boiler house in the middle of the camp. Germans decided to use that facility as a workhouse for military purposes. There was an old chimney that they decided to put down because they didn't need it. So they cut the supporting wires, but didn't finish the process before the, uh, uh, the weekend. The chimney was barely standing, just uh, it was holding by one or two, uh, two supporting wires only. Um, now, um, it happened during the weekend. Major Kruger called the prisoners to line up in order. There were a few announcements ongoing when everyone noticed that an old huge chimney started to fall down. Everyone but Major Kruger. He was standing at the pulpit, at the uh, platform, and the shadow was not moving away from the officer, but became less and less. And that was very clear. It is falling, falling straight on Kruger. And then something happened. The prisoner number seven or nine rushed forward straight to the major. And the, the soldiers who were guarding could not react uh, they, they could not shoot because they might shoot an officer. So they just looked at what was happening, what was unfolding. Andrew jumped on the officer and pushed him off the scaffold. So they rolled over and fall down. The same moment, the chimney crashed on the scaffold where the officer was standing, let's say, a few seconds ago. All the frozen. Why did he do that? To all, that would be a fair reckon with him. That was a long-awaited deli deliverance. Kruger was lost ever. He was speechless. He couldn't comprehend the logic behind this deed, but he vividly remembered what Andrew told him the day before all the prisoners. He uh, hurried to, to, to make some orders, got into the car, and left. Andrew was called to take a shower and change his cloth. And then he was put into the officer's car and left the camp. Since then, nobody has seen him anymore. He was released, and he came back home safely. Friends, question here. What are our attitudes towards a new reality, sometimes a hostile reality? What is our attitude? Are we going to cry as people of Israel in, the, in Babylon, or we are going to serve and love and pray? for the enemies, for the circumstances, for whatever threatens us. Exile is a move to correct. But you know, we don't like to be corrected. We like to correct others sometimes, but not to be corrected. 
The third instance, the persecution experience. Moving further away uh, to the time of the New Testament and the new church emerging after Jesus had uh, uh, left the, the earth, in uh, the book of Acts, we can see the church growing. We can see the church was in peace and it was really growing and it was thriving in Jerusalem. Everything was so great there. Apostles were performing miracles. People were um, in harmony and peace together. They were fellowshipping together and um, uh, many multitudes were joining the church. But then something happened. After such a good peaceful time, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it says in, in verse 1, uh, at the time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered. And that persecution was related to Saul's, um, to the person named Saul. Because Saul was not happy with the church. He wanted to get rid of the church because for him as a Jewish zealot, it was an obstacle to the way of uh, Messiah. He thought that he needs to do something with this movement, which was threatening Israel's identity and, and, and safety. And it says uh, in verse three, in Acts uh, eight verse three, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. You can see that uh, it, was, it was a turbulent time. And, um, you know, uh, try to imagine yourself, put yourself in the shoes of those first Christians, first followers of Jesus. It was not easy for them. They were pushed out of their uh, communities of their comforts. They went to other lands, to other cities to begin from the scratch, to be, you know, they, they, they did not have anything with them. So it was a painful experience. But what was God's perspective behind that experience? Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it says, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. <clears throat> so that was a blessing a blessed experience of, of starting a mission work in the new places, in new cities, in new lands. Even more, that, more to that, in the book of Acts chapter 11, it says, verses 20 to 21, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, uh, who then, when they heard, had come, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the, word, uh, the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of believe, number believed and turned to the Lord. You can see that this was a blessed move, because uh, they started this church in Antioch, which became soon a, a new mission base to reaching the whole Europe, uh, to reach the the whole Roman world. That was uh, a strategic uh, move. So we can see that God was behind that painful move. And what seemed to be a havoc from the first side later had become the beginning of the worldwide movement. You can see that uh, the church expanded greatly after that move from Jerusalem. They were pushed from Jerusalem and now they reached Antioch. And from Antioch, Paul and Silas, they went further to Europe to start this uh, mission work. So moving is expanding our mission. Moving is expanding our mission. You know, um, in the Philippines, uh, I found a good way out of my stress because in the Philippines, we, we are... Um, you know, uh, experiencing a, a huge, a strong lockdown. And this is, uh, you know, the, the longest lockdown in the whole world, I believe. Uh, it, at least this it is what I read. 
uh, we started from March and never ended. It's still uh, under quarantine and we cannot go out so much. We, we need to use our buses. We, we cannot bring out our children and the family members, only one member of the family can go out to shop. And, you know, only once a day, <laughs> before it was once a week. <laughs> now it's good that we can go out once a day from the campus, but still uh, it is stressful. So I found, I found my refuge, uh, well, many things. Uh, I exercise myself also, but I'm also doing gardening. And one thing I noticed in gardening, that uh, the plants are teaching us so many precious lessons. And one of the lessons is this lesson of resilience. Um, earlier this year, in the month, month of January, we experienced an, uh, a volcano eruption. In January 12th, this year, um, then all of a sudden the sky uh, turned gray and there was a, a rain, but not ordinary rain. The rain was with the ashfall, very heavy rain. Um, you know, literally very heavy rain. Um, the cars could not uh, wipe the windshields. It was very difficult to drive. I could barely make it home. And then, uh, you know, the asphalt continued for the whole night. And when uh, we uh, woke up in the morning, this is what we saw. Everything was covered with ash in our backyard, in the, all the plants. And this is my, my, my plants that were, you know, covered with this acid ash, volcanic ash, and everything was dying. Um, at least I thought everything was dying. This was a strong smell of sulfur in the air and uh, the, uh, the plants turned uh, gray and then they turned black. And so um, I saw my, uh, everything was, was turned black. Uh, my tomatoes, I, I, I planted them so many and I was so much disappointed. I was almost crying and said, Lord, everything has perished. But look, lo and behold, after a few weeks, uh, what happened? Yeah, this is exactly what I did. I started to wash my plants. After that, I washed them out, but this was heavy ash, maybe two to three centimeters uh, of, of, lay, uh, of layer. Well, uh, my plants survived. And not, that one, not only survived, but they started a new buds appeared from the nodes, then started offshoots, and soon the plants seemingly dead were all covered with green vegetation. They were not only surviving, but really thriving. The harvest this year, I could hardly imagine. It was so plentiful, not like ever before. The, the same plants that were seemingly dying be, uh, beneath the, the ash fall, they survived and they yielded a plentiful harvest. So it uh, learned, it, it bring me a, a, a precious lesson that everything in the nature is created with the ability to adapt to an aggressive reality. Friends, I recall another painful experience of persecution in my own country for 70 years. There was a huge pressure from the government to suppress the church. In Soviet times, the church was in the tight position. And the only problem in the church was how to survive because all the ministers were put into jail or they were uh, killed. They were murdered actually and uh, executed in some camps, concentration camps during Stalin's time. Uh, there was one of uh, these uh, uh, leaders in uh, Russia. Actually, he was the first ordained minister in Russia. He was a native of German, Germany, uh, Henrik Lepsak. You know, uh, he knew that he will be arrested soon. And it was, it happened in 1934 when uh, in the apartment when he lived, somebody knocked in the door and then they knew that that was uh, a police. 
when he opened the door, the soldiers came in and you, they told him, um, Mr. Lepsak, you are under arrest. And then he turned back to his uh, fellow leaders and he said these words that uh, was the last words ever heard from him. Brothers, work and do not get tired. God's work as a river, which nobody can stop. He was hit by the face, but he added with his bleeding lips, work, work, and never get tired. He was shot dead in 1938, without any trials. Um, but his work and the, the, the Lord's work never get stopped in Russia and in the whole Soviet Union. The church did not only survive, but actually it grows, it grew, it grew in number. And uh, people, um, you know, were bold to preach the gospel despite these um, difficult circumstances. Friends, let's go back to the boat. Um, Ellen White says, the disciples were in the midst of troubled waters. Their thoughts were stormy and unreasonable and the Lord gave them something else to afflict their souls and occupy their minds. Friends, listen to this. Sometimes we are so preoccupied with our own ideas, with our own plans, our own dreams, even in the church and for the church, that God tries to occupy our minds with something else. And it says, uh, I like this, this statement. It's, it's a brilliant statement. God often does this when men create burdens and troubles for themselves. God often does this when we ourselves, we create our burdens. So disciples were burdened with their ideas about Jesus. But in, uh, you know, in the midst of the storm, their thoughts, their everything was cleared to zero. They started to think about something else. And now Jesus was able to start talking to them again. I believe, friends, that God allows these moves to happen for our own benefit, for cleansing our, cleansing our minds to prepare us for future ministry. Does that mean that God has left us alone? No, no way. In, uh, in Mark 6, 49 to 52, Jesus, and it says, when they saw him, so Jesus was walking towards them by the sea. When they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and they were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them and the wind ceased. Friends, we should never think, should never let, be think, uh, let our thoughts, provoking thoughts, you know, allow that we are alone in this troubled sea. In this troubled sea of pandemic, we are never alone. Jesus came along <clears throat> and he did not abandon his disciples. He was walking through the stormy sea to save them. In like manner, he is with us during these uneasy times. So from all these examples that we just, uh, just ex uh, explored right now, in all these instances, uh, the divine move was an instrument to correct people's perception about God, their self-perception and their mission. Because we need this correct, uh, correction, we need this adjustment to understand better our God and to understand better ourselves and also what are we going to do. God's move is indeed an instrument. It is an opportunity to grow in faith. It is an opportunity to 
start a new beginning in mission. Indeed, it is a new beginning. As I see here in the Philippines, so many pastors, they started their own uh, um, internet uh, online ministry. Some of the pastors' families, they are uh, broadcasting their family worships every morning and every evening. There are so many pastors starting evangelize, uh, evangelistic programs online. There is definitely a blessing behind this painful experience. But there was yet another movement in history that was like, unlike these moves that were forceful and unplanned experience, that was voluntary and planned move. Jesus went down from heaven to earth and he was planning to come and moving towards this earth to save us. This was a move to intervene in our miserable history and to give us all hope. He, he left the splendor of heaven to move to the dark and hostile earth to introduce the most dramatic change ever imagined. Friends, I want to turn our attention to the, to the uh, memory verse that we just read this uh, before the sermon. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. This is very true to our own experience. We need to learn to humble ourselves. We need to learn to be obedient to God and to, to not to resist, not to impose our own understanding, our own vision to the church, to others, to, to ourselves, but to ask, to accept that God wants us to, to do. Um, it is only when you hit the bottom uh, you can jump off. You can kick off to a new height. You have to die first in order to be resurrected. I like this statement, friends, and I want to leave uh, this statement with you today as I finish my sermon. Holiness is constant agreement with God. I like this statement, friends. Ho holiness is constant agreement, meaning that you don't have to fight always with God. You don't have to try to impose your own ideas, but you agree with God's movement. You agree with God's will in your life, in the life of us as a church, as a, as a community, in our whole history that we now experience. More than that, our little troubles today our little storms that we now are going through prepare us for the time of trouble in the future when the elements of nature will start to have fallen apart when there are many changes will be launched and we could not, we will not explain everything we will not understand everything but we want to understand if we learn to trust in God today in, in if we learn how to follow God, follow God's leading today, we'll be prepared for the time of turbulence, for the time of trouble, much in much greater scale than we experience today. So in conclusion, I would like to submit, remember that God moves people for different purposes. And we mentioned today at least three of them, to grow us, as people of God, to bring us to himself, to bring him, uh, us closer to him, to correct us, to, to make ourselves think about our own behavior, our own life. What is wrong with us? Maybe there is something that we need to get rid of. And finally, to expand our service to the world, to prepare us for the, for the grand mission, for for new opportunities to reach other people for different, new, different ways. When we face uncertain future, when we are forced to move to a new reality, 
we can be sure God will go with us there. Friends, today as I finish the sermon, I wish we all learn from these new circumstances and we will be going through and going out of this even more prepared, even more refined, even closer to, to God than ever before. May God bless us all. Amen.